In today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. Well, a good day to you, and thanks for joining us here for another episode of Veracity Hill, where we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Very nice to be with you here. Episode 177, coming to you every week, roughly speaking, on Saturdays. Sometimes we have uh, live shows. Most of the time we do live shows. Sometimes we have pre-recorded episodes. Uh, Believe it or not, today is a pre-recorded episode if you're watching this on Saturday. We're taking the weekend off because of the Thanksgiving holiday. So I hope by this time you've had a very fine Thanksgiving meal with your family, friends, and loved ones. And uh, we've got just a a couple uh, exciting episodes coming up here towards the end of the year as we um, get almost to the new decade. Uh, We're going to do a two-part series uh, today and next week on the New Testament scriptures, looking at the canon, the origin, uh, the writing of the New Testament documents. I know some of my followers have been interested. Uh, I've given a very pop-level talk on the canon, but... uh, I just have sort of a preliminary reading, so I figured we should bring on some scholars uh, to uh, enlighten us and go deeper on this subject uh, and who can be of benefit to us. Uh, And so that's what we're going to be starting today. I do want to mention this. On Tuesday, uh, it's Giving Tuesday, uh, which is a... um, Uh, Not quite a holiday, but a movement started by a number of nonprofits. You see, uh, Thanksgiving is a Thursday. Then you have Black Friday, uh, which you have all those deals and sales. And then it's Cyber Monday. So by the time you've spent all of your money, the nonprofits are still wondering, will you give to our causes? And so I do want to mention that uh, on Giving Tuesday, if you would consider um, participating in that movement by uh, contributing to our weekly program so we can continue to go and grow here at Verizon. Veracity Hill. Thank you for your consideration. Please go to our website, veracityhill.com. Click on that patron tab so you can learn more. We'd love to get your recurring support. Uh, well, as I mentioned, we're talking about uh, the canon and scripture. And uh, on today's program, uh, we're joined by uh, Dr. Michael Kruger, who's the president and professor of New Testament at Reformed Theological Seminary. He's the author of many books, including this uh, ever popular book, The Question of Canon. And Chris told me if I hold it up with our green screen, uh, the, the, the book has a slight green hue, and apparently you can see through it maybe. I don't know. Can people see my hand if I hold it behind? No, he says no. no just, the just the background. All right. Well, at any rate, so we've got it up here uh, on my monitor, if I can do this correctly. But uh, IVP is doing a, a great sale right now, and you can um, check get 50% off the book here for Christmas. So use that IVP code uh, Xmas19, and you can get 50% off. So there it is. The question of canon. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris. All right, so there it is. Uh, Dr. Michael Kruger, thanks for joining us uh, on our program today. Yeah, great to be with you guys. I didn't know the book was on sale. I might pick up a few copies myself. So, <laughs> Well, hopefully you'll get an author's discount, uh, at least maybe the equivalent, 50% off. Yeah, I, I thought I'd say that's about all we get. 50%. <laughs> yeah, I just saw that as well. So they're, they're starting their, uh, their Black Friday deals early. I've seen more of that happening um, with, with folks uh, doing that. They're trying to beat the rush, I guess. <laughs> All right, so let me ask you before we jump in here. You know, this this book was published in 2013, um, but I continue to see it in catalogs. I see it online. Uh, You've kept up with writing on the topic of canon, and I think that's uh, uh, contributed to its ongoing success. Uh, So did you expect um, the sort of popularity and and long-term support of this book when you uh, first wrote it? Well, I mean, you never know when you write a book how it's going to do, and and uh, it's obviously a very specialty book. It's a niche book. I don't expect it to be to get a wide readership at a popular level. Obviously, I, it's not a person in the few book, but it is hopefully being used by pastors, scholars, and Christian leaders. You want to understand canon, uh, and I wrote it really hopefully to, to to shift the discussion a little bit away from the traditional spots and onto new spots. And if I've been successful at doing that, then that would be encouraging to know. Yeah, very nice. So what got you initially interested in studying the canon? Well, I mean, if you go all the way back, uh, it takes me to the story of of, of uh, my undergraduate years at UNC Chapel Hill, um, where I was actually a student there and had Bart Ehrman as a professor, as an undergraduate, 
and many will know the name Bart Ehrman, a, a very well-known biblical scholar and, and probably one of the most vocal critics of Christianity and the New Testament text and so on. And yeah, there I sat, freshman year, took him as religion professor, and it opened my eyes to all kinds of issues, particularly canon and text. And that sparked an interest that uh, took me all the way here to where I am today, through many steps, obviously. But it's, it's, it's a, amazing to think back that that's where it started. Yeah. We've uh, just had uh, Dr. Ehrman at our annual Defenders Conference, uh, where he engaged uh, uh, on the topic of gospel differences with Dr. Craig Keener, Dr. Mike Lacone, and Dr. Rob Bowman. And so it was very fascinating to bring a non-Christian to a Christian event. Uh, was uh, something that actually the audience really enjoyed, and uh, it was good to get that challenge. And, and in fact, Bart himself was um, uh, sort of pleased uh, at his reception and was... Uh, um, maybe I could say surprised at the view of inerrancy specifically that uh, Lacona and Keener were defending, and he called it on Facebook intellectually sustainable. Uh, very fascinating. So for you, though, um, now uh, I, I take it you were a believer then uh, at UNC Chapel Hill, and studying under Ehrman didn't uh, deter you from uh, having a genuine faith in Jesus as, as Lord and Savior? Yeah, that's right. I grew up in a Christian home. I entered uh, UNC Chapel Hill as a as a believer. Herman and I sort of have opposite trajectories in our stories. He 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 went to a Christian college and then sort of went to seminary um, at a liberal school and, and and lost his 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 beliefs. Then I I went to a secular university and and obviously had my beliefs challenged and then ended up on a different path. So um, yeah, I started as a Christian. It certainly was a challenge though to try to maintain your beliefs in the midst of the barrage of criticisms that were leveled at you. And, you know, what 19 year old can, can answer those questions? I mean, none. And so you just sat there and took it for mm. a whole semester and that's, that's hard, but, uh, the Lord used it to redirect me and make me go deeper into what I believe. Yeah. That, that's a good testimony that there are people that go and learn from non-believers at secular institutions and, um, yeah. they, they take it as a challenge. Um, but that doesn't deter them from forsaking their faith. Um, uh, yeah, that's a great testimony. All right, we've already thrown around this term canon. When we think about the New Testament uh, and we think about the scriptures and canon, we need to uh, define our terms, if, if you will. Um, some people might think when you use that word canon, you think kaboom. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's not yeah. quite the type of canon we're talking about. So what do these terms canon and scripture mean? And, and is there a debate over their definition? Yeah, well, people get confused on the term canon. My students often misspell it with two ends, like you said. That's the kind of canon you fire from a, you know, at a castle or from a pirate ship or something. And <laughs> um, my website's called Canon Fodder, which is actually a pun on that. And if you don't understand what canon's in view, you won't get the pun. But uh, yeah, the, the, the canon we're talking about has one N, C A N O N. And the word just in and of itself just means standard or rule or some sort of measuring stick, if you will, by which you measure something. And we use the term in our nomenclature in the modern day in lots of ways. Now, when we refer to the canon of Scripture, we're referring to sort of the, 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 the biblical, scriptural inspired books that God gave his corporate church. And that's the way I typically define it in, a, in brief order. Now, you indicated there's a debate there, and there is. There's actually a massive debate about how to think about canon, and we'll get into that as far as you want. But for the average person in the pew, the canon is just simply that collection of books that God gave his people. So when I say which books are in the canon, what we mean is, which books should I consider scripture? Which books are in the church's recognized collection of writings that, that we think come from God? What um, I, I, I would be interested to get into the um, discussion about the definition, because I think some of it arises from uh, some misconceptions, some, some pop-level misconceptions, and then, yeah. as you argue, maybe even some academic misconceptions. So the, the pop-level one especially, the, the most common thing I hear is, oh, well, the New Testament books were decided at the Council of Nicaea, you know, in three, yeah. 325. So uh, what type of definition or understanding would that be, and, and why is that misguided? Yeah, well, that's said by a lot of people in the academy, outside the academy, even by pastors. I, hear, I heard a famous pastor preach a sermon not long ago where he said the church didn't have a canon until the 4th century Ugh. or 5th century. The church didn't have a Bible. <laughs> And, you know, I hear those sorts of things. I'm like, well, that's very misleading. Depends on what one means by that. A very popular uh, meaning for canon that a lot of people use is the idea that the canon is a fixed, closed, final list of books that's all neat and tidy and, and finalized by some authority like the church. Now, 
I suppose if you worked with that definition, you wouldn't have a canon until the fourth century. Okay, fair enough. But of course, in my book, The Question of Canon, I ask the question, why should we consider that as the only way to think of canon? Why do we have to look at it as something that you can only talk about when the process is over and all is finalized? What if you talked about it while it was in process? So what if we define canon not as a fixed final closed list of books, but what if we just defined it as uh, books that were regarded and used as or functioned as scripture? Well, you have that a lot, a long time before the fourth century. In mm. fact, I argue you have that as early as certainly the second, and depending on how you look at it, even in the first. And so then you could say, well, we have a canon in the second century. It's not maybe the edges aren't solidified. Maybe there's some d- disputes about a few of them, but as a whole, you still have a core collection. That needs to be said, and for famous uh, individuals who keep saying there's no canon to the fourth century, they're just not telling the whole story. Mm, mm. So um, the idea that the canon was uh, formalized and finalized and served as the authority in, uh, at the earliest in the fourth century, you call that the exclusive uh, yeah. def- definition? That's right. And then you contrast that with a functional view. Um Right, which I also just described, right, which right. is the functional view is that if books are actually operating like scripture in the life of the church, can't you say that there's a functioning canon at that point? Yeah. Right, right. So it's being served and useful, uh, mm-hmm. even perhaps in the first century. But um, why would that even be slightly off? Is there a, a, a better alternative against those two? Well, I don't know if there's a better alternative, but there is more to say. Um, as I say in my book, I think each of those definitions have their place. Mm. Each capture some truth about the canon. It is true that it wasn't until the fourth century that you have it all neat and tidy. Um, it's also true that long before the fourth century, you have a core collection of books functioning as scripture pretty plainly. But then there's another core truth that, that I mentioned in my book, and that is that, well, wait a second. If these books were, were given by God, by divine inspiration, then couldn't we look at the canon from from sort of God's perspective or divine perspective? So if we did, don't we have a canon as soon as God gave us a book? Mm-hmm. Um, in other words, to put it differently, why do we only look at canon in terms of reception um, or recognition? Couldn't there be a canon that exists even before someone ever knew it existed? Uh, and I argue this is the ontological view of canon, which I know is, is an abstract thought for people, but I think it's important to recognize because what it what it reminds them of is that canon is more than just what humans do to books. We don't we don't just simply say, well, the church made a decision, and therefore we have a canon. No, we're recognizing something that already existed. And if it already existed, then there has to be a way to say it was there from the start. And as soon as we say that, then we have a canon even in the first century, if you look at it from the divine perspective. And so I think that's an important uh, angle as well. Right. So um, what you're saying here is that uh, regardless of how it was used, um, or rather— Maybe I should say, not necessarily because it was used a certain way, um, and that it's not about when people recognized it as authoritative, but that after it was written, whether it be, I mean, 10 seconds after the book was completed, there is a sort of divine status. So when the the churches, if someone's looking into this topic and they see the discussion between the councils about what books should be authoritative— they're talking about recognizing which books have been given by God. They're not saying um, we now decide because our authority and not these Correct. other books. So, if you're rec- if, think of it this way: if 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 churches are simply recognizing something that's already there, not something they're 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 declaring or making, but they're recognizing something that's already there, then you can ask the question: well, When was it already there? Or what, what's the date of the books having that status? And the answer is as soon as they were given. So you can look at a canon as something given by God. Therefore, you have a canon as soon as the last book is given by God in the first century. We have a canon. Does anyone know it yet? Well, not fully, but doesn't mean it's not there. Um, And then as it starts functioning, you say you have a canon that's operating. And finally, you have a fixed closed list. And so I look at it sort of as a in in three different perspectives. And I, I have these triangular diagrams in my book where I map that out. And I think each is partially true, but you really need to have all three as a, as a glimpse of the whole. Mm. Uh, This, um, piques my interest a little bit about uh, the canon being closed. Um, yeah. Uh, so let's suppose uh, we uh, find some um, pots in a cave in uh, Turkey uh, somewhere, and lo and behold, there's this letter, and it says, um, Paul to the, the church at Laodicea. Um, 
<laughs> should should we and let's suppose it is the authentic letter that we uh, read about in the New Testament. You know, Paul wrote other letters, and we just don't have them. Yeah. But should we consider uh, reopening uh, the canon if if we were to discover something like that? Yeah, I uh, I go back and forth on this. This is one of those complex, confusing <laughs> issues to disagree on. I, I don't think that will happen, obviously. But if it were to happen, um, it's certainly possible that we could say the church could recognize it as, as Paul's, just like they recognize it as Paul's in the first century. Although I think we're at a significant disadvantage now than we were would have been in the first century as the church. But regardless, let's assume we could recognize it as Paul's. Then, then certainly we would consider it as scripture. Um, yeah. Yeah. But there's also another side of the equation, which is that the canon, by definition, were foundational books for the church. Right. And if it just sat dormant for a thousand years or two thousand years, I should say, and never really functioned as a as a as a as a book for the church as its foundation, then one could argue that that you don't put it in the canon because it isn't really what canon is. Canon is a you know, the books that the church built itself on, and this clearly wasn't one of them. So uh, you you could sort of split it either way. So yeah, that's a toss up. Depends which day you catch me, I'll probably give you a different answer. <laughs> That's great. I think it would be fascinating, especially, uh, you know, Peter says that Paul writes difficult things to understand. And, and certainly we don't have that other side of the conversation with the letters. We don't know what they wrote to, to Paul. So, you know, a lot of our theological discussions on the um, non-essential doctrines uh, are, are based on that, are trying to figure out what was the other side of that conversation. And uh, but it would be fascinating if, if one of those letters sort of uh, clarified some of the issues uh, that we talk about to this present day in which in some debates have been going on for centuries. Uh, <laughs> right. I mean, and, and this is, of course, the problem with what we call apocryphal books. Right. There mm. were, quote, unquote, later books of Paul suddenly discovered in somebody's, <laughs> you know, uh, Mason masonry jar. And um, and, and we, we for the most part, we, we determine all those to be later forgeries. Yeah. And so that was tried, actually. Um, there we have several things where people attempted to address modern theological questions through this magical appearance of a brand new letter of Paul, and it never really worked out to be considered authentic. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, well, let's let's move along uh, from the sort of definition and descriptions of of that term canon uh, and talk about the uh, the origin now. Um, uh, by which I, I mean two eyes, not one eye, referring to the church father. Uh, <laughs> um, the Jewish culture uh, in the first century was very much based on an oral tradition. Uh, what reason do we have for thinking that the church would have written down documents at, at an early time period? So th there are debates between conservatives and liberals um, and and. You know, some people might disagree with my terminology there, but between people who think in the early dates of the New Testament documents, generally speaking, versus others who might think the later dates. And uh, sometimes the liberal class, especially over the past 150, 200 years, has had to revise the dates of certain writings because of the manuscript evidence that's come to light. Um, but, but why should we think that, um, you know, say uh, Luke wrote before 70 AD or something like that, and not rather that there was a communal process uh, in which the document was finalized hundreds of years later. Yeah, well, you know, I think you're trying to get to the issue of orality and textuality in early Christianity, and there's no doubt that in the earliest stages, the message of Christianity was transmitted orally. Um, it was by word of mouth, uh, and, and I would argue it wasn't by communal tradition. And by that, meaning you know, we're not talking about sort of anonymous oral tradition that just anybody talks about. We're talking about uh, oral testimony from particular tradents and eyewitnesses that would have been the ones that were to be the guardians of the of the message. They would have done that in an early stage, certainly on a, on a verbal level, but it wasn't long till they started writing. Um, we, we know certainly there was even earlier sources than we possess, if you believe in a Q document, or other types of, of notebooks that early Christians would have. We know they started writing early, um, and certainly by the 40s, they were well into writing what we regard now as the New Testament books, and certainly by the 50s, they were in full full bore mode. And I explore in my book, why why write down these things? You know, why 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 would you bother putting pen to, to papyrus? Um, I think it's pretty straightforward, some of the reasons. I mean, the, the main reason being the permanency of it. I think it became very clear that the apostolic mission was not gonna be accomplished 
by those men in their lifetime. They needed some way to preserve the message for future generations. And that's what you did in the ancient world. Even if you were an eyewitness of an historical event and you told your story, which was fine and normal, eventually you knew that you yourself as an eyewitness were going to be gone and you'd have to leave that story in a permanent form for future generations. And I think that they, they did what the Old Testament did. They wrote down the message they received from, from God and they put it in a form that, that later generations could use. Why is it that there are, um, and this gets a little bit into to authorship, um, uh, scholars can uh, widely agree on, say, some of Paul's letters, say, 1 Corinthians or Galatians, but when it comes to uh, what are commonly called the pastoral epistles, why do they think that Paul did not write these and that they were written by someone later on? M- maybe late 1st century, maybe even 2nd or 3rd century. Right, and this isn't true just for the pastorals. It's true for books like Ephesians and Colossians, 1 Thessalonians. It's also true for Second Peter and so there's this belief that many of the letters we have in the New Testament are what's called pseudonymous. They're falsely authored. They're authored by someone pretending to be somebody else. Uh, the reasons that are that we that those arguments are made are multidimensional. Um, primarily, those arguments are built on stylistic differences. So if you have a core collection of Paul's letters you're pretty certain about, and you compare those with other letters that you're less certain about, and they don't match stylistically, then you say, well, these other letters must not be from Paul. Um, and then you put them on the shelf as pseudonymous. And there's other historical reasons, too. For example, within the case of Second Peter, we don't have a lot of early patristic testimony about Second Peter, so it looks like it could be late for that reason as well. So there's lots of arguments that go into these books. I, I find the stylistic arguments relatively unpersuasive, and I think many scholars do as well. Um, there's an inherent limitation and subjectivity to it. I don't mind stylistic arguments if we have an anonymous book, like Hebrews, or if we have a book that we're not sure who wrote it, but if you have an authorial claim overturning an authorial claim through stylistic uh, discussions can be pretty complicated. Um, you know, you almost have to assume that the breadth of an author's linguistic scope is already determined by the, by the letters you do possess in order to rule out the letters you don't. And, and it's just very difficult to do that. Authors speak different, differently in different circumstances and different occasions and with different topics. Uh, it, that argument, I, ha- I think, has limits, and it's hard to, to know how much weight to put on them. And so what you're saying is... Um Maybe uh, when Paul writes to a church, he's got a certain tone, but when he writes to an individual, it could be a different tone. But based yeah, upon- yeah, Absolutely. And when he writes about different subjects. So when you, when you write about certain topics, you're, you're, you know, the, the tone he has with the Galatians is not going to be the same tone um, that he has um, in other contexts because of the sort of chiding nature of that, of that particular letter. And you know, some, some, some letters are more heavy and, and, and some less so. Um, you, know, you think about 1 Corinthians, that's a it's a very heavy letter in terms of the type of issues Paul's addressing. Yeah. So yeah, you know, people speak differently in different circumstances. I wonder if someone can pull out various things I've written <laughs> over the years and probably prove I didn't write it. You know, <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, right, right. I certainly think in um, Philemon, uh, you see that he's he's buttering up uh, his recipient, uh, speaking very highly of him and, and hoping that he will receive uh, Onesimus uh, kindly upon uh, the slave's return. Uh, so... Yeah, and, and buttering someone up in order to win them over to your side might be a little different than how Paul wants to treat Timothy, who's, you know, maybe a, a mentor uh, fi- figure. Yeah. Uh, Mentor-mentee, yeah. So that's something we should expect, yeah. I certainly see a motivation for some people to want to put a late date um, in dealing with canon and, and scripture uh, because in, uh, I think it's it's First Timothy, uh, Paul talks about, the scripture says, and he quotes from the Old Testament, but then he, he quotes from Luke as well. Um, yeah, First Timothy 5.18, it's a very interesting passage. I think it, it receives far too little attention. Um, I actually wrote a full-length article on this for a recent festra for Stan Porter that came out mm, last year, two years ago. Um, and I, I, I probed pretty deeply into that text and some of the history of its interpretation. Um, yeah, the, the, we don't know that he's quoting from Luke. But it is true that he's quoting a passage that the only known match is in Luke. Ah, fair. uh, Luke and 7. And I think there's good reasons to think it might just be Luke. Right. So it could, hypothetically speaking, come from the Q source, if that were a document. Um, I think think it could. And we always have to say that. We don't know for sure. And it's possible. But, of course, I think it's it's more likely that Luke is possible or or, or is the case just by virtue of the fact that— Travel companions— 
Paul and Luke are, are friends, and of course this presumes Paul wrote First Timothy, right? Which is its own debate. That's right. Yes, uh, yes. But assuming that for a moment, if you could think of it this way, if Paul were to cite any gospel, what's the most likely gospel he would cite? Answer Luke. Um, yeah. And so, you know, and, and the idea that Paul cites Q as scripture, even though we don't have Q, and we don't know that Q is ever regarded as scripture, but we do know that Luke was eventually regarded as scripture. And so the arrows, I think, point most likely to Luke being the source, although, again, we can't be sure. Right, right. And I agree, yeah, the most likely um, so gospel he would cite, I think, would be Luke. He he also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in 1 Corinthians, when he's talking about um, the Last Supper and the Eucharist, I believe he also cites, uh, do this in remembrance of me, which only appears in Luke. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to do a study about other Luke and trends within Paul, yeah. and whether one could, could deduce that he knew Luke from other ways. Before I forget, what's the name of your article uh, that you wrote on this stuff? Because it really interests me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. The title off the top of my head is, I, I, I think it's something like First Timothy 5.18 and an early canonical consciousness, consciousness rethinking a difficult text. Okay. It's like one of those that. big, long academic titles. Yeah, I got yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Good. Well, I'll try uh, to find but it. The, but if you look up, the, the Festra for Stan Porter is... Uh, something like New Testament literature, language, and theology or something. It's E.J. Brill is the publisher. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think it wouldn't be hard to find. It uh, for go to my, What you could do is go to my website and look under articles, and it's the, I've written the, 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 the bibliographical information there. Good, good. Yeah, I'll check that out. Um, it's fascinating for, for people who are willing to af affirm the uh, authenticity of First Timothy as Pauline. Um it has implications for the dating of Luke, I think. And and a lot of people want to date Luke, you know, late 60s or something like that. They say, well, if, if the fall of Jerusalem happened, Luke would have mentioned it. So, But he doesn't. So it's, it's probably late 60s, something like that. Um, but but maybe it was, in fact, quite a bit earlier. Um, so I, It's only possible. First Timothy 5.18 raises those questions. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Um, all right, well, uh, we're going to take a, a short break here, Dr. Kruger. This is a, an enlightening uh, conversation. Um, I, I feel like I'm getting meaty answers and I'm, I'm, I'm back in university again. It's, it's good. <laughs> uh, all right. Good. So, so we'll take a short break here. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation. Um, I'll, I'll certainly want to ask you about what covenant has to do with, uh, canon. And so, uh, and, and along with some other questions, and then we've got a few segments on the show uh, coming up as well. Uh, stick with us through this short break from our sponsors. Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Evangelical Christians are talking about hell. What if we believe what we believe because we've always believed it? What if the gospel is really a matter of life and death? We want you to open your mind, open your Bible, and rethink hell. At RethinkingHell.com, evangelicals look at what the Bible says about hell, putting conventional and controversial views to the test. Let's say there's this Christian apologist. You love their message, but have trouble finding their videos, their articles, or social media posts. How do you stay connected to them? We're on it. Defenders Media uses the tools of the digital age to create content for your favorite apologists. We give them more screen time, more digital soapboxes, and more presence to deliver more of the content that you love. That's what we do. I know that social media is important to those of you who follow my work. Many respond to my videos and posts on Facebook and Twitter, but it becomes impossible after a while to keep up with it all and to continue with research. That's why I'm thrilled that we have found a solution, Defenders Media. Whether it's a website, whether it's printed material, whether it's a question on graphics, I cannot do what I do and reach my audience without the help of Defenders Media. They have been integral in helping me to reach my audience. Defenders Media ensures consistent content reaches your hand from today's leading apologists and apologetic ministries, like Mike Lycona, Apologetics 315, the Veracity Hill Podcast with Kurt Jarris, and more. To learn more, text the word DEFENDERS to 555-888, and we'll send you a free PDF of the top five ways to share the gospel online.
Thanks for sticking with us through that short break from our sponsors. If you'd like to learn how you can become a sponsor, you can go to our website, veracityhill.com, click on that patron tab, and you can learn more. We'd love to help uh, promote your uh, forthcoming book, uh, your organization, your business perhaps, or your ministry. And uh, we certainly appreciate the partnerships that we have with our sponsors. Well, on today's episode, we're talking about the New Testament scriptures. We're looking at canon. Uh, we're looking at the, uh, the writings and formation and uh, a number of other topics, the dating of the New Testament scriptures. Uh, there's a very popular misconception out there that the books of the New Testament were decided at the Council of Nicaea in uh, 325. And so we've already looked at that sort of myth and have been uh, considering other topics as well uh, on our program today. We're joined by uh, Dr. Michael Kruger. Uh, but before we jump back into that conversation, we've got a new-ish segment on the show uh, called, Chris, what's it called again? What's Behind Kurt? What's Behind Kurt? We're hoping to get a jingle to that soon. You know, what's behind Kurt? Something like that. It'd be a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I think Chris is going to make that too. <laughs> You'll hear multiple voices of Chris. All right, here's the way it works. 12 questions, right? Yep, 12 questions, modifications of the 20 questions. Yeah, we're going to have to change that, I think, to like 15. I, I, I got close, really close the first two times. Mm-hmm. This is week four now. Last week I was really off. All right. Um, and and the name of the game is What's Behind Kurt because, well, we've got a green screen behind me. Uh, well, it's not green for you. Unless Chris were to, like, turn off the... Yeah, I could, I could totally turn it off right now. Oops. Okay. Hold on. Oh, well, maybe not. He's there working it on it. So there... Okay. Right. All right. So. That's green. All right. We've got twelve. I get to ask twelve questions. There is something behind me, and I have no idea what it is. Um, all right. So, are we? Uh, um, there is something behind Kurt. Okay. There's something behind me. Mark's already smiling. <laughs> okay. Uh, is it a person? No. Is it a place? No. Is it an object? Yes. Is it a toy? No. Oof. Wow, someone picked something hard this week. Which reminds me, by the way, if you want to submit uh, a thing, just email Chris, chris at defendersmedia.com. It's not a toy. Is it a tool? No. Oh, gosh. I'm I'm on my way to the worst uh, segment ever here. (sighs) It's an object. You've used it's, five of your questions. Okay. Um, You're not halfway there yet. You're still, still in the game. Is it something people buy at a store? Yes. Can you get this at Walmart? Yes. Is it a food item? No. Is it something you'd buy in the entertainment section? No. He had to think about that one, though. Oof. Um, Oh, boy. Is it a furniture item? No. I'm running out of questions. This is bad. How many? You got two left. Oh, I only have two left. (laughs) Two questions. It's something you'd get at Walmart. Um, It's not food, not entertainment. Is, Is it in office supplies? No. Oh, uh, one left. I'm just going to have to go for it. Is it baby diapers? No. That would have been amazing <laughs> if I got it right. All right. This was definitely the worst one ever. Mm. Uh, I had trouble narrowing it down with the object. I'm, I'm learning, though. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's. I feel a little bad about the food question. you got to be very specific. It is a can of Dr. Pepper. Oh. Which is a drink item. Oh my gosh, shame on me. I think I should just retire. <laughs> oh gosh, it's a can of so Dr. You, Pepper. Yeah, you got in the neighborhood. See, with food, I was thinking food and drink. That's what I thought you meant, but I was like, oh, I, I don't know how to answer that without yeah. giving it away. All right, well, that's yeah. tough. All right, that's it for this segment oh, of yeah. What's Behind Kurt. Again, if you want to uh, send in a suggestion... Email chris at defendersmedia.com. Send a JPEG along with it. What's the specific answer? So, like, if it's Tim Allen, but you want to go for Tim the Toolman Taylor, tell Chris that, the proper answer, and he'll work on forming the the answers 
Yeah, good. All right. Well, now let's get uh, Dr. Kruger back involved uh, for the program. Uh, all right, Dr. Kruger, we do a, a shorter shorter segment for sure now with our guests called Rapid Questions, and it's a 60-second uh, 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 clip here. We're going to ask you um, short questions totally not related to the canon of Scripture. And uh, could you confirm to our viewers that I did not clue you in on this? No, that's why I'm wondering if I should participate. So we'll see. <laughs> so they're just short, goofy things. We get to learn a little bit more about you. Um, you know, favorite movie, that type of thing. Um, so uh, it, it's just 60 seconds, and if you're ready, I will start the game clock, and, and we'll give it a go. You set? Yeah. Okay. All right, here we go. KFC or Taco Bell? I'll go with Taco Bell. Uh, what's your favorite movie? Oh, man. You got to go with genre there. I, I'd say something. So, Bears of the Lost Ark. How's that? Okay, nice. Uh, Apple or Android? Do you have an iPhone? I have an Android, but I'm not loyal to it. Okay. Uh, Coke or Pepsi? Pepsi, for sure. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, wh- who's your favorite superhero? Batman, of course. Okay. Uh, when you get to heaven, what do you want to hear when you arrive at the pearly gates? Well, well done. Good and faithful turn will be nice. <laughs> uh, pick a fictional character you'd like to meet. Homer Simpson. Uh, if you had to sing karaoke, what song would you pick? Wow, I haven't got a clue. How about the national anthem? Okay. What's your inner milkshake flavor? What was the definition of inner? Um, that's a, that's a very good question. I don't know. We've done 177 I mean, like, episodes. Is there a milkshake flavor, or what do I think? Uh, maybe I'm confused with the Yeah, question. like, like your personality type, if you had to associate oh. it with a milkshake flavor. <laughs> no clue. I not so many options, is there? Like chocolate, vanilla, and, I mean, I, I love vanilla milkshakes, but I don't know if that has anything to do with, with the inner right. milkshake. Right, right, right. look at it. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's true. All right, I have to ask some follow-up questions. You'd like to meet... Did I hear you correctly? Homer Simpson? Yes. Okay. And the most intelligent and funny show on TV. <laughs> I, think, I think both Chris and Mark want to hear more about this. Uh, so tell us. Oh, yeah. Tell us more. One funny 25-year cultural satire. <laughs> we don't have too many scholars that are, are big uh, Simpsons uh, fans. There's more than you think. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, so, which Springfield is it? That's what I want to know. I never tell you. No, they don't, uh, do they? <laughs> okay, and uh, why do you like Batman as a superhero? Well, I was more first thing in my head. Um, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think he's a little more real. He's he's That's human. There's stuff. nothing mutant or freakish about him, is yeah. there? Yeah, so he's, uh, you know, it almost gives us hope, like, one of us someday if we're just uber wealthy rich. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, maybe that's true. Very realistic. Good. All right, well, thank you for playing that round of rapid questions. Always fun to learn a little little bit more uh, about uh, uh, our guests. And, of course, I know we just, uh, we met in person last week at uh, ETS, uh, but next time I see you, I'll definitely want to pick your brain more about The Simpsons. That's that's great. Absolutely. (laughs) Same episode. Good. Okay, uh, jumping back to our conversation about uh, the canon of Scripture and its formulation. Uh, there's a section in your book where you uh, talk about the, uh, the, the cultural context, the cultural milieu of Jewish writers, and that they would have had in mind a robust sense of covenant. Um, yeah. What does covenant, though, have to do with... Um, writing down letters to churches, you know, sending letters to churches and, and, and the like, which would come to form the canon of the New Testament. Yeah, well, I think it all has to do with the Old Testament background. So you have to remember the earliest Christian writers, the earliest Christian followers were all Jews, and they would have been um, immersed in their old Old Testament context. And when you read the Old Testament, it's very clear that what you're reading are what we would call covenant documents. They are the the materialization of God's promises, his covenant arrangement with his people, um, sort of the terms and conditions of the covenant effectively are what you're reading when you read the Old Testament writings. And so they would have already had a, a, a worldview, if you want to think of it that way, where, where covenants, contracts, if you will, always have written manifestations. You don't just make up a covenant in thin air, you have a, a written text that goes along with it. 
Um, and this was this was classic for the ancient world, not just for for uh, the Old Testament uh, Israel, but also ancient uh, covenant treaties uh, in the Hittite world as well, which would have been part of the Old Testament backdrop. And given that context, you just have to ask the question: What would happen if early Christians came to think that God was inaugurating a new covenant? What would they think was going to be going on with that, associated with that? Well, given the very close connection between covenants and written texts, I argue in my book that there would have been an anticipation, an expectation that God would deliver a new written manifestation of his covenant terms and conditions and so on, and promises and, 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 and uh, things beyond that. And, and so what, what that does is it frames the debate differently. So rather than thinking of, of written documents as somehow foreign to Christianity and imposed on Christianity and something they never would have thought about, I argue that there's something more natural about it than we might have thought. And there might have even been some sense that they were looking for such deliveries hmm. of covenant documents. And if they were, they would look to God's special agents, his covenant ambassadors, what Paul himself refers to himself as a minister of the covenant, a minister of the new covenant, and that's what the apostles were, as the very people who would deliver such documents. So it just frames the debate differently and gives us a context by which we realize a, a, a canon would not have been an unnatural imposition. It would have been a fairly organic development. Yeah, and uh, for perhaps, say, um, Greco-Roman authors, the idea and notion of covenant wouldn't have uh, jived as much uh, if they were to have written uh, the works. So if we do find covenant language, as we do, we would expect right. that to come from a Jewish author. Yeah, and people forget that the, it's actually called the New Covenant. I mean, the word testament is just the Latin version of diatheke, and so... You know, we use Old and New Testament, but it's really Old and New Covenant. And you realize that canon and covenant, therefore, are tightly linked. Yeah. Yeah. First covenant and second covenant. Uh, I've uh, one of my, uh, well, my former youth pastor, he's a senior pastor now at church. That's what he prefers uh, because he thinks if, if we call it old, then people don't pay attention to it. Uh, it's in the past. Um, but yeah. first gives us that background. Okay, so what role then, uh, if uh, the the apostles were Jews, what role did the apostles play in canon formation? Well, as I hinted out a moment ago, you know, once you have sort of uh, authoritative agents that speak for Jesus and represent him, which is what the apostles were, and that's their own self-awareness, that's also what they say in their letters that they are, and what we learn in the Gospels that they are, is that they are the ambassadors, the spokesmen for Christ. I, I tell my students, you think of it as, as Jesus' authorized biographers, right? They are authorized to tell Jesus' story. Now, as soon as you have an office like that, um, we, 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 we do recognize that that office was executed, at least at first, verbally. They would go and give Jesus' story by preaching it and teaching it um, by word of mouth. But what would happen if an authorized agent, like an apostle, wrote something down, wrote that story down? Well, then we would expect that that story would then have mm. no different authority than the verbal word. Yeah. Um, and if so, then what would people do with such books that were written down by an authoritative agent of Christ? Well, they would regard them as having a special status, a status that is bearing the very authority of an apostle, and therefore the very authority of Christ. Now, there's really one word we use for that, and that's Scripture. I mean, you know, whether you use the word or not is sort of beside the point, but there's they're writing authoritative books that speak for Christ, and, the, and, and if so, then that changes the dynamics too, because now you don't need to wait for some 4th century decision to have a canon. You don't need to wait for some later act of the church to have a collection of books. Apparently, you would have a canon as soon as the apostles started writing books. And so you just have it from the start, so to speak. What would you say for, um, say, uh, Luke's gospel or Mark's gospel? Uh, so far as we know, they were not eyewitnesses. Uh, why should we consider them apostolic then, if that's asking the right question? Yeah, that's right. And I, and I make a point in the book that, that the issue isn't so much... Um, who held the pen, uh, the issue is, does this volume uh, bear direct apostolic content? Is it, is it, is it, is apostolic teaching and scripturated? Um, and it's very clear that in Luke's prologue, he, he, he gives a nod to his source, which is those who are there from the beginning, who are eyewitnesses of these things, is where he gets his material. And Mark, we know, is a follower of Peter and, and on down the line. So it's, it's a little bit neither here nor there, whether they were the, whether the authors themselves were apostles, um, but whether the, the the book itself is presenting itself as an apostolic writing, um, and it's cu it's curious to note that the that the early patristic writers viewed it, viewed Luke and, and Mark as apostolic men. Um, they put him within the apostolic orbit for exactly those reasons. Mm. Great, uh, that's the way you phrased it. I mean, it was just 
I feel like the dots were just linked all straight through for me. So that's a very concise uh, thank you. That's, and I hope others listening to that uh, were able to help to connect the dots as well. These weren't just um, these weren't just believers like we're believers. These are people that knew Jesus, were entrusted to give the, the teachings and to pass those along, or the, you know one degree from that. So the, the content is still apostolic. Um, the first thing you said was like, it doesn't matter whose who's hand is holding the pen as long as right. it's, it's, it's that teaching. Great. All right. Now, we could probably do a whole episode on my sort of uh, broad uh, question here. Um, <laughs> what role do the church fathers play in helping us to decipher who, who wrote the canon, what qualified as canon, and, and how do we date um, the, the books based on what they wrote? Yeah, so the church plays a, f- a very important role. God gives books to his people, right? And he expects his people to receive and listen and follow his, bo- his books. So the, ju- the church's job collectively is to recognize and receive what God has already done. And so the church's role is not to make books authoritative. It's not to constitute authority. The church's job is to react um, and respond to what is objectively true already about these books. And that's a very important distinction. Um, the Protestant view in particular, it doesn't view the church as creating the canon or constituting the canon, but as responding and reacting to what God has already done. And so the church simply, uh, by the help of the Holy Spirit, recognizes the books that are from God. So when someone asks, well, how do I know which books are from God? I think the church can tell us that. I think the consensus of the church of the ages is a great indicator of which books we should regard as canonical, not because the church is infallible, um, but because the church is a, is a reliable responder to what God has already done uh, in these books. And so the analogy I give in my, in my uh, volume there, not, not in the volume you have there, but in my other book, Canada Revisited, is that think of the, the church as, uh, as kind of a thermometer rather than a thermostat. So a thermometer is something that responds to temperature. A thermostat is something that controls the temperature. So the Catholic view would be more like the, the, the church is controlling the temperature in the room. It's kind of like operating like a thermostat. Uh, the, the Protestants are like, no, the, the, they're a thermometer. They react to what's already true. So when you look at a thermometer, thermo- thermometers don't determine what the temperature is. They just respond to it. Mm. Um, so we would agree that there's a close connection between um, the canon and the church, just like there's a close connection between uh, the thermometer and the temperature. But, it's the, but, the, but, the, but the causation is in the wrong order. Um, it, it's, it's caused by the, the room temperature, not by the thermometer. Yeah, that's a nice analogy. Now the uh, the documents themselves, perhaps on the the actual um, uh, papyri, ha- have authorship, or sometimes uh, in in the letters they might stay, be in the content of the letter. So, like with the Gospels, it would say the Gospel according to Matthew, but you know we wouldn't know that from reading uh, the content itself. What role does the do the Church Fathers play in helping us uh, determine? the authenticity of the letters, because there, there were disputes over which ones were authentic and which ones were not um, in the first few centuries. Yeah, well, when we want to know whether a book is written by the name attached to it, there's lots of ways to do that. Um, you know, one is the, is the titles. Where, when were they added, particularly in the Gospels? And they were added, we think, very early. Um, but patristic testimony is one of the number one ways we know what who wrote a book. Um, and, and people think, well, why would we do that? I mean, it makes total sense why you do that. I mean, who has a better shot of knowing who wrote John, me or someone who lived right after John? Um, you know, someone in the second century would have a much better chance of knowing who wrote John's gospel than I would or any other modern scholar. And so the patristic testimony has to be given significant weight. It's not infallible, uh, but it has to be given significant weight. Um, and when you look at it, the, the patristic testimony around our New Testament books is quite unified. Um, is there some dispute about some of the smaller books? Of course, and we could get into Second Peter or, you know, Second, Third John and, and James and so on. But um, but for the most part, there's great unanimity about who wrote these books, and we have reasons to think it goes way back to the earliest sources. I mean, think about the statement of Papias, for example, early uh, church father in the second century. He tells us about the fact that we have two gospels named Mark and Matthew, and he tells us his source is this mysterious person called the Elder that dates all the way back to the 80s of the first century. Now, that, that's an early source, and so we already have a named gospel as early as the first century there, and that, that's, that, that, that speaks to reliability of, 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 of who wrote those books. As the, um, the church was seeking to recognize which books uh, are canon, uh, 
what was the timeline like until, you know, towards the beginning of the show, we talked about sort of fourth century. What, what was that timeline when some things were firm and then there was still some discussion, but eventually they're like, okay, this is it. This is what we've recognized as right. divinely inspired. Well, I think it's, it's helpful for your listeners to think of something that we call a core canon. C-O-R-E. Um, and this core canon is, is basically visible from about the middle of the second century. And by, by core, what I mean is about 22 out of the 27 books seem fairly well established by the middle of the second century. We know that from a no- number of sources. I'm not going to go through the list here. Um, I, you can read what I've written, but um, it's pretty well established. Um, and these would include the, the big things, four gospels, 13 letters of Paul, first John, first Peter, uh, usually Hebrews, Revelation, etc. And it's just a handful of the smaller books that are that, that run into any any challenges. So by the middle of the second century, we have this core in place with a, with a little bit of discussion about some of these peripheral books. And it takes a few generations to get that resolved. By the fourth century, even the peripheral books, largely speaking, are resolved and things have settled down quite a bit about the canon. But once again, back to our earlier conversation, it's, it's misleading to say you don't have a canon of the fourth century. You do. I mean, if I if I ask someone, could you build a pretty good theology out of 22 books of the New Testament? I would think you could build a pretty good theology. Um, would you have a fairly orthodox Christianity out of 22 books? Yeah. So you're not you're not stumbling around in the dark there. And that's the impression people give, that no one knew what to read, everybody's disagreeing. No, there was a core there, and that core needs to be appreciated. Very nice. Good. Um, well, is there anything um, that you wish some people would take away? I know we kind of talked about the Council of Nicaea myth, um, but what are some other things that people need to keep in mind when they're thinking about how to understand the canon? Well, actually, I, I direct them to a series I did on my website. So I did I did 10 things every Christian should memorize about the New Testament canon. Uh, and I did another series about 10 myths about the New Testament canon. And they can go to my website. It's called Canon Fodder. Uh, the URL is michaeljkruger.com. And you can find those series in the lower left corner of the page and just read about all the things that are there. And it's a lay-level, introductory, basic uh, look at uh, what the, the broad outline of the origins of the canon is. And hopefully that's a good place for them to start. The, uh, the 10 blog post series is a very good one. I've happened to read it myself. So (laughs) good. Great. Uh, Last question before we let you go. Um, What are some things you've been working on uh, recently and what do you hope to to publish in the future? Wow. There's a lot there. So (laughs) um, too much, actually. I've I've got a number of articles forthcoming um, that'll be out this year. Uh, One on miniature codices and early Christianity, which is a very micro scholarly subject, which most of your listeners probably don't care much about. I've got an article, a uh, chapter in a book coming forward on, a, on the covenant theme in the Gospels, which I think is interesting. Um, and then uh, I'm working on uh, some articles for a Festriff, and I can't name who it's for. Ah. Um, and so it's uh, there's a lot, lot of stuff I'm working on on a more academic level. And then I've got some future book projects that or in the hopper, which I, I won't dive into here, but uh, always a lot to do and then trying to keep my head above water. Yeah, that's right. And it seems like you're a busy guy from all the books in the background there, which is probably only like a third of your library, uh, you know, at home. <laughs> Keeps me busy. Good. Well, uh, please do keep me updated on, on uh, your publications. We'd love to bring you back on. I've enjoyed our conversation today. I, uh, like I said, I feel like I've gone back to university and uh, man, <laughs> jumping right back in. Good. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kruger. Again, um, if folks want to check that out, uh, the name of your blog is uh, Cannon Fodder. Great punny name. I love it. And uh, we'll be sure to put a link at, at our website as well so uh, folks can go uh, right to it. And a link, we'll put a link to the, the 10 blog post series uh, on Canon, which is very helpful. Uh, again, for those that are interested, uh, the question of Canon challenging the status quo in the New Testament debate. Um, again, I'll hold the book up, but you'll see it mixed with my logo there. We've got it. It's available at University Press's website, and you can get 50% off uh, there with that code, uh, which is uh, Xmas19. Uh, so 50% off. Get a copy for yourself. Buy a copy for your loved ones or your child. Uh, make sure they can get this um, very engaging book, well-documented resource book uh, by Dr. Kruger. Well, that does it for the program I'm uh, today. I'm grateful for the continued support of our patrons. Those are folks that just chip in a couple bucks each month. I'm also thankful for the partnerships we have with our sponsors. They are Defenders Media, Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, the Illinois Family Institute, and Fox Restoration. I want to thank our technical producer, Chris, and our communications associate, Mark, for all the fine work they do week in, week out. 
I also want to thank our guest today, uh, Dr. Michael Kruger. And last but not least, I want to thank you uh, for listening in and for striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.